Pfizer is poised to pull in a hundred billion dollars this year. They can't even carry all that money. Pre-COVID, they're making about 40 billion a year. 60% of their revenue comes from their COVID products, Paxlovid and their vaccine. Enter a new New England Journal of Medicine study. This is about the fourth dose. It's the real world results, real world, which is slang for observational study where we didn't assign treatments. It's the real world, real world study, fourth dose of the Pfizer vaccine, COVID-19 in a nation, in a nationwide setting. That's what they call it. And this is a a target trial emulation, a fancy observational study. And I think it is better than a lot of the observational studies, but it has a bunch of flaws, and I want to walk you through that. Now, let's think about the issue here. In this country, even though Pfizer didn't ask for it, they only asked for 65 and above, our FDA decided that it would be sensible to give an EUA for 50 and up for the fourth dose. So they've go, gone ahead and granted it and I'm sure by now a 51-year-old healthy person who had three doses and maybe even a superimposed Omicron infection has gone out and gotten that fourth dose. And that person has no solid randomized data to back that decision. And they, to be honest, they don't have great data at all. We're going to talk about that. This paper, of course, looks at 60 and up. It's 60 and up. Of course, even in this paper, they didn't go down to 50. They go look at 60 and up. And what they're doing in this large insurance database from Israel is they're taking all the people who got the fourth dose when their fourth dose was authorized, which is four months after your third dose, and they compare it to people who got three doses. And they do a matching system where they try to match the person based on the same age and other demographics to try to get it as close as they can. So they're trying to say people who got that fourth dose versus people who didn't get that fourth dose. Let's go look at the outcomes. And they look at a number of outcomes. I think they look at five different outcomes, including do you have PCR positivity for SARS-CoV-2? Do you have symptomatic SARS-CoV-2? Do you have severe SARS-CoV-2? Are you hospitalized for SARS-CoV-2? And do you die from SARS-CoV-2? And that is what they look at. Now, when you look at these kinds of comparisons, one might think, what would be the perfect study? The perfect study is simple. It would require Pfizer to take just a little bit of their $100 billion, just a little tiny bit of their $100 billion, and do a randomized study in people who've had three doses. You gather together 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 60-year-olds and up, and they've all had three doses, and then you randomly assign them to a fourth dose or a placebo fourth dose, and you follow to see what is the further reduction in severe disease and hospitalization? What do you get from that fourth dose? That would be the perfect study. Of course, we could do that perfect study. Actually, nothing stops us from doing that perfect study. The FDA could get and make Pfizer do that perfect study. They could earn that $100 billion. But instead, we let them debut their products. And Israel has allowed them to pretty much turn the whole country into an uncontrolled experiment and allow them to debut their products. And then the thing we do instead, we compare the outcomes and the people who rushed to get the fourth dose and got it very quickly versus the people who didn't rush to get the fourth dose, got it later, or didn't get it at all. We compare those outcomes. But the problem is that they're not exactly the same kind of person. The type of person who's gotten three doses in their arm and they're 60 years old, they're eligible for the fourth dose and they immediately make a beeline for that fourth dose. That's the kind of person who's probably pretty cautious about COVID-19. They're pretty concerned. They might be doing a whole host of other things that uh, demonstrates that concern. They're probably also of a higher socioeconomic status. They're also more likely to engage in other salutator salutary health behaviors. They're otherwise taking care of their health. And so if you look at a study like this, you always worry about that problem, which is that there's some other difference than the fourth dose. And that is what epidemiologists call residual confounding. This is a particular type of confounding that we call confounding by indication, that you're actually confounding by the mere fact that you elected to do something. Now, the authors here are going to try to assure us that they don't have that confounding present. And my job isn't to prove that they have residual confounding. My job is merely to suggest that they haven't excluded it. And as long as they haven't excluded it, they really need to pony up and do that randomized study. So how do I make that argument? There's a few lines of argument that I'll draw upon. Number one, I'm going to show you the PCR curves, and I'm going to show you the symptomatic COVID-19 curves. I'm going to show you two, I think, plots right here. And the point I want to make here is that these curves do not split before day seven. They are overlapping, and then at day seven, they start to split. And that kind of makes sense, because I don't think anyone thinks that that booster can work instantly. Either it's got to rev up the antibodies, or it's got to awaken the T cells. It's got to do something in the body. It's not going to do it right away. It's going to take a little bit of time. And these authors can see that. They write in their own paper. They do not expect any difference and outcomes until seven days. And lo and behold, you don't see a whiff of a difference in even one of the earliest signs that you're symptomatic COVID until seven days. Okay, now hospitalizations. If the hospital signal is due to the vaccine, I don't expect to see anything until, you know, 
even thereafter, you got to avoid getting COVID. And then you need a little bit of time, a few days, a week to start to see a signal in hospitalizations. And if you see it sooner, it actually suggests something problematic. It suggests that the people who got the vaccine were already on track to have fewer hospitalizations. They're behaving differently. There's residual confounding. And lo and behold, I'm going to show you the figure. You see it on day eight. You see on day eight that there is a difference in hospitalizations. That's just too fast. It's only one day after there's a reduction in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. It's too fast to be due to the vaccine. It's got to be due to the fact that they're different people fundamentally. And then if you look at severe COVID, it also splits a little bit too early. If you look at deaths, it starts to split on day 12. That's just too soon. I'm going to show you another figure by Anil Mackam, who's kind of plotted out the time to avoid getting COVID, the incubation period, and then the hospitalization period. If it splits on day 12, it's too soon, and it suggests that they were less likely to die of COVID even before they got the vaccine. So it's not due to the vaccine. It was due to who they are. Now, that's just one way you could kind of tease these apart. Another way is something we call falsification endpoints. And with my colleague from Harvard, Bob Pujena, we wrote a paper in JAMA about falsification endpoints and how they can help observational studies. I think that was 2014 or something like that, a JAMA viewpoint. Go check it out. It's a, I think, pretty decently cited paper all these years later. A falsification endpoint is an endpoint that you don't think could be due from the intervention, and you go and see, lo and behold, it couldn't be changed by the COVID vaccine, the fourth dose, so let me show that it isn't. That's a falsification test. And the easiest falsification test that these authors have is non-COVID-19 death. The COVID-19 vaccine should lower the risk of COVID-19 death, but the COVID-19 vaccine shouldn't alter the risk of non-COVID death. It shouldn't prevent heart attacks or strokes, and it shouldn't prevent cancers. It's like nothing to do with that. It's got to do with COVID-19. So a simple falsification test is to show me the non-COVID-19 mortality outcomes. Show me those outcomes and prove to me that they are the same in these two groups. And here's what I suspect. If there's residual confounding, if the people who rush to get the fourth dose are otherwise healthier, or wealthier, or wiser than those who didn't rush, there will be a difference in non-COVID-19 death. And that difference will favor that arm. And that's implausibly due to vaccine. It's got to be due to who they are, and that would be a warning sign. But I look through the manuscript, and lo and behold, they don't want to tell me. They don't want to tell me this useful piece of information. Who failed? The New England Journal failed. The reviewers, you failed. And the authors, you failed too. You all failed to give me information that I want. I don't like that. And I suspect the reason you failed is that everyone's going along with the bandwagon. Everyone loves to have more doses, loves to support that. But they failed. The last point, the third check, the third check, the third check is to look at vaccine efficacy by day. It shouldn't work right away. It's got to take some time. So if there's a difference in the risk of SARS-CoV-2 acquisition on day one or day two, it's just too good to be true. It can't be due to the vaccine. It's got to be due to the types of people who are getting the vaccine. And lo and behold, the authors show the authors show vaccine effectiveness by day. And there is a huge difference early on days one, two, three where it's implausibly due to the vaccine. It's got to be due to different people. They're saying that it's probably due to the fact that some people who are not getting the vaccine are over-enriched with people who just came down with COVID that just started to feel bad, and that's what kept them at bay, the healthy vaccine effect. That's what they say. Well, that's possible, but it's also possible that there are other deeper differences in their behavior, not just that acute difference, and that's key because if there's a deeper difference, they got a deep problem in their study. And here's why I think it's, there's a deeper difference, because if you expected it only to be a healthy vaccine E effect, the vaccine effectiveness, when it drops down as it does on day five, it should be, I think it, it should drop down to zero and maybe even dip below uh, because it should be sort of equally distributed around zero, at least for the first seven days. But what you see is it's almost always better than zero. It's always got some non-zero vaccine effectiveness with the exception of just one day. So I think on average, it's a little bit too good to be true. And I think that does suggest that there is some residual, residual confounding in this data set. And I think that's another way to look at it. At the end of the day, you know, their excuses for that time, that time effect are just that. There, it's rhetoric. It's not really a fact. So what's my point here? I cannot prove to you, I can never prove that there is residual confounding and the burden is not on me to prove it. The burden is on you to take away that doubt in my mind and you've not taken it away. I look at multiple strands of evidence like it's time too good to be true. There's no falsification testing and this other thing, but vaccine effectiveness by day. And I think it's an impl it's, there's very likely to be residual confounding. And the only way to settle this issue is for Pfizer to take that 60 bills, those $60 billion that they're paying out all their executives and Borla's got 20 
million bonus this, or 20 million payment this year and take some of that money and run some randomized control trials. And you know who needs to make them run those randomized trials? The US FDA. And you know who would have? Gruber and Krauss, had they been at the FDA, they would have made them. But they've been pushed out by this administration and we are rubber stamping all these EUAs and that is unacceptable. Pfizer deserves all the money if they make a successful product that saves lives, but they got to earn that money. They got to prove it. And they got to prove to me the fourth dose saves lives. I have no clue if a 51-year-old healthy person benefits from the fourth dose. I have no clue if a 61-year-old healthy person, the topic of this study, actually benefits or if there's residual confounding. That's just not good enough. That's just not good enough to sell your products in this country. People say the randomized trial would have taken too long. In fact, these authors allege that. Get out of here. If the randomized trial was the only way to gain access to the fourth dose, it would enroll in seven days. Don't make those excuses to me. I know good and well it would enroll quickly. Don't make excuses for Pfizer. They can run that clinical trial. This White House has permitted them to get away with selling these products, and we're already at the fourth dose. I don't know how many more doses they want. I thought the purpose of mRNA was they could easily swap out um, the construct, the specific DNA sequencing. They don't appear to be doing that. They just want to keep offloading what they've already manufactured. That needs high levels of evidence. And it's not just that you prevent runny noses. You've got to prevent severe disease and hospitalizations and death from those additional doses. That burden has yet to be made. You haven't proven that. And this study has at least three reasons why I suspect there's residual confounding confounding by indication that the people rushing to get that fourth dose are healthier, wealthier, and wiser than those that don't. And they're engaging in other patterns of behavior. And so what I suspect is they may have non-COVID mortality outcomes that favor them. Finally, data sharing. You know, many years ago, it was the deputy editor, Dan Longo, and the editor who wrote a little article called Research Parasites. And they say, all you people out there who want access to data that we publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, you're the parasites out there. We're the ones doing the data collection, the analysis. You're parasites. You just want to, you just want to leech off of, leech off of primary data and analysts. Well, this is a good example of why they were totally wrong. I fought them at the time, and I still think that they were wrong. They need to make the data sets available with these publications so that anyone, anyone can run those numbers and see and look at these non-COVID mortality outcomes. Anyone can look at that and should see. That's what it means. We're talking about products that societies are spending tens of billions of dollars on collectively. Don't we, the public, have have a right to have access to the data, to know that the data is faithful? I think... You could say you should have trust in your regulators. Well, I would have liked to have trust in my regulators, but we have the two most important people at FDA vaccine products being pushed out, citing political pressure, citing the boot on their neck to approve boosters. What am I to think about that? Am I still to have faith and confidence in that agency? No, I want to look at the data myself, and I do. I would love to see the data. Make it available. Give me those falsification endpoints. And more importantly, make Pfizer run the randomized study. They got the money for it. They are literally carrying away piles and piles of money. We need to have them use some of that money for the public good. And the last point, many health policy experts are up in arms about uh, aducanumab or aduhelm, Alzheimer's drug. And they say things like, we don't know for sure if it helps Alzheimer's patients. It's going to cost so much money. We don't know. Where are those voices on this issue? You don't know for sure that a 51-year-old healthy person at three doses and possibly a breakthrough infection will benefit from the fourth dose. Why are you silent on this issue? We need to compel this manufacturer, just like we needed to compel Biogen, to generate robust clinical trial evidence to support that choice. And it's the same thing. In fact, maybe you know, this is a, maybe it's even worse. You know, this is a population of healthy people. This is a population that it could go on in perpetuity. There's no limit to it. Um, if you are upset about the Alzheimer's drug, you need to be upset about this drug. Why, where's your voice? And I think those voice, voices are silent for the same reason. Many voices have been silent because they're so concerned about their own career and not willing to step up and say the right thing. So make Borla earn his pay. We need randomized control trials. I cannot prove there's residual confounding, but I cannot exclude it. And these things are clues that give me doubt. This is what you get on this channel. You get the analysis of medical information. If you like what you see, like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.